Thank you for standing by, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Safe Brokers Conference Hall on the fourth quarter ended December 31st, 2023 Financial Review. We have with us Mr. Polis Ajuanu, uh, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Lucas Rampari, President, and Mr. Constantinos Adamopoulos, Chief Financial Officer of the company. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. There will be a presentation followed by a question and answer session, at which time, if you wish to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone keypad and wait for your name to be announced. Following this conference call, if you need any further inf information on the conference call or on the presentation, please contact Capital Link at 212-661-7566. I must advise you that this conference is being recorded today, February 13th, 13th 2024. The archived webcast of the conference call will soon be made available on the Safe, uh, Safe Bulkers website, www.safebulkers.com. Many of the remarks today contain forward-looking statements based on current expectations. Actual results may differ materially from the results projected from those forward-looking statements. Additional information concerning factors that can cause the actual results to differ materially from those in the forward-looking statements is contained in the fourth quarter ended December 31, 2023 earnings release which is available on the Safe Walkers website, again, www.safewalkers.com. I would now like to turn the conference call to one of your speakers today, uh, President Dr. Lucas Van Barry. Please go ahead, sir. Good morning. I'm Lucas Barbaris, President of Safe Bankers. Welcome to our conference call and webcast to discuss the financial results for the fourth quarter of 2023. During the last quarter of the year, we operated in an improved charter market environment compared to the previous quarter. The company continues to maintain a strong capital structure while implementing its strategy of gradual fleet renewal that leads to decreasing fleet average age. Our ongoing efforts to upgrade our existing vessels coupled with our fleet renewal will enable, us to will enable us to remain competitive while reducing our carbon footprint. Yesterday, just before the issuance of our earnings press release, we announced the sale of our oldest vessel, MV Marie. This gives me the opportunity to focus on our investment strategy, which takes into account our existing ESG policy and prepares our company for the new, more stringent regulatory environment in relation to carbon emissions. In slide three, we present the, environment, the environmental regulations timeline. We have been trying to be ahead of the market, for example, by placing phase three orders when only phase two regulations kicked in and sell older vessels, and more recently by placing all orders for dual fuel vessels. You see in slide four the challenge that the dry bulk shipping industry faces as we move with steady steps towards 2030. Ad advanced uh, phase three energy efficiency vessels are only a few, creating operational and commercial advantage for the early movers. We move to early and in slide five, given our recent deliveries, we have maintained a very competitive average age and we intend to do the same in the years to come with the remaining order book. All our actions should build up a green fleet advantage as presented in the top right graph of slide six. Our fleet is comprised of eco vessels built after 2014, conventional vessels which have been environmentally upgraded, and phase three orbits which now account for 20% of our fleet. Only six of our 46 vessels in our fleet vessels are scheduled to be upgraded. On the bottom graph, a synopsis of our fleet renewal is presented with 12 vessels sold the last few years, having average age of 15 years old and 16 vessels acquired, nine of which new builds and seven second-hand with lower average age of, of nine years old. Let's now focus on the market. In slide seven, there has been significant volatility in the Cape market. It's worth noting that all eight of our Capes are period chartered with an average remaining chartered duration of about two years at an average daily rate of about $23.6 thousand dollars with the market currently at about 20.5 thousand. On the Panama side, the charter market remains stable. The expectation, as referred by the paper market, is optimistic. The interesting point here in slide eight 
is that the supply side is relatively weak, creating upside potential after the Chinese New Year holidays. The total dry bulk order book stands at single digits. We remain, we remain cautiously optimistic about the medium-term prospects of the trade market in the coming years due to the, this healthy order book. About 25% of the medium-sized fleet is older than 15 years, thus the effect of fleet aging and environmental regulations are expected to accelerate scrapping. Japanese big vessels have more efficient design, and uh, please note that 82% of our fleet is Japanese built versus 40% of the global fleet, which means that our fleet can compete better in the forthcoming environmental based other market. We are one of the very few dry bulk companies with a phase three order book ahead of our years, timely placed at lower than the personal market values, signifying our intention to compete on the basis of operational and environmental performance. Moving to slide 9, we present the development of the CRB Commodity Index, reflecting the basic commodity, commodities future, uh, futures prices, which represent the leading indicators for shipping, including energy, agriculture, metals, and industrial metals. We continue to witness the rise of uh, intensification of geopolitical tensions, noting the Middle East region, Red Sea, and Ukraine. We witness the greater than expected resilience in U.S. and, se and uh, several larger emerging markets and developing economies, as well as a significant fiscal support in China. Inflation falling faster than expected in most, in most regions is in, in uh, the midst of uh, unwinding supply side issues and uh, re restricting monetary policies. The general forecast of IMF raised much the project, the projected global GDP growth for uh, 2024 to 3.1% as global inflation projection for 2024 stands at 5.8%, lower than the previous forecast. According to BIMCO, the forecasted global dry bulk demand growth stands at 1% increase for 2024. Yet the battle against inflation is not clearly won with inflation expectations well anchored in major economies. In China, the IMF general projection of GDP growth for 2024 stood at 4.6%. China recovery seems stable even after taking into account the fiscal support, and even though the Chinese inflation is near zero due to the existing domestic difficulties, such as the elevated debt, weakness in proper in property sector, structural factors such as aging, which weigh on growth. On the other hand, India's growth is said to remain resilient despite the global challenges underpinned by Europa's domestic demand, strong public infrastructure investments and a strengthening financial sector as we tell in the IMF's January projection for a 6.5% increase in GDP for 2024. Concluding our market view, in slide 10 there has been an increased industry-wide volatility driven by tight monetary policies and rising geoeconomic implementation. There are signs of disinflation and forecasts of, of stable growth for the next two years. Demand for technological efficiency creates opportunities for those willing to invest in as safe budgets has done. It is evident that the ESG adherence becomes increasingly important for the years to come. Environmentally efficient fleets may lead to a two-tier market with differentials in earning capability. We believe that the combined effect of the aging of the fleet, the low order uh, lower selling speeds of the new regulations and uh, uh, GAG targets will favor fleets comprising of efficient vessels tightening the market. I will conclude with slide 11. We will present certain of our key characteristics which we can see us from our fears. The key fundamentals are our strong alignment of interest with a significant percentage of management ownership, the comfortable leverage, the ample liquidity and contracted revenues, our track record and, uh, of course, the quality and competitiveness of our fleet. Our operating model is positioned to capitalize on the new more stringent environmental regulations with assets focused on environmental competitiveness and ESG strategy. At the same time, we are committed to reward shareholders with meaningful dividends while actively building our future fleet competitiveness with a substantial fleet expansion. Our uh, our, chief executive, uh, our chief financial officer, Mr. Dinos Adamopoulos, uh, will continue the presentation. Mr. Dinos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucas, and good morning to all.
As a general note, during the fourth quarter of 2023, we operated in a weaker charter market environment compared to the same period in 2022, with decreased revenues due to lower charter highs, decreased earnings from scabby fee diversions, decreased operating expenses, and higher interest expenses due to higher interest rates. Let's focus now on our liquidity, our cash flows, and our capital structure, which is presented in slide 12. We are maintaining a comfortable leverage of around 37%. Our debt of 516 million remains comparable to our fleet scrap value of 341 million, although our fleet is only 10 years old. Our weighted average interest rates stood at 6.3, 6.31% for our consolidated debt, and this is inclusive of, of the applicable low margin with a portion of 100 million euros being fixed at, two, at a coupon of 2.95% uh, with an unsecured five-year bond. We have paid 85 million for our capital expenditure requirements in relation to our existing order book. The remaining capex were 223 million. Our liquidity and capital resources stand up strong at approximately 312 million which together with the contracted revenue of about 270 million provide flexibility to our management in capital allocation. Furthermore, we have additional borrowing capacity in relation to eight existing unencumbered vessels and six and seven new builds upon their delivery. Moving on to slide 13, with our quarterly financial highlights for the fourth quarter of 2023 compared to the same period of 2022. Our adjusted debit for the fourth quarter of 2023 stood at uh, $50.7 million, compared to $56 million for the same period in 2022. Our adjusted earnings per share for the fourth quarter of 2023 was $0.25. Cents. This was calculated on a weighted average number of 111.6 million shares, compared to $0.29 cents during the same period in 2022. And that was calculated in a weighted average number of 118.9 million shares. We will present this slide 14, our quarterly operational highlights for the fourth quarter of 2023, compared to the same period of 2022. During the fourth quarter of 2023, we operated on average 45.93 vessels, earning an average time charter equivalent of $18,321. Compared to 44 vessels and an average TC of $21,078 during the same period in 2022. Our net income for the fourth quarter of 23 was $27.6 million compared to net income of $34.9 million during the same period in 2022. In conclusion, in slide 15, we present our recent new bill deliveries. Based on our financial performance, the company's board of directors declared $0.05 cent dividend per common share. We would like to emphasize that the company is maintaining a healthy cash position, revolving credit facilities and a drone borrowing capacity, altogether a combined liquidity and capital resources north of $300 million. Furthermore, we have contracted revenue from our non-cancellable spot and period time charter contracts of more than $240 million and this is made of commissions and before any scrap the revenue, and additional borrowing capacity in relation to eight unencumbered existing ships and seven new bits upon their delivery. We believe our strong liquidity and our comfortable leverage will enable us to expand the fleet while still rewarding our shareholders. Thank you, I'm now ready to accept questions. Thank you. We will, at this time, we will be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation form will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star key. Our first question comes from the line of Omar Anokta with Jeffrey. Please proceed with your question. Thank you. Hey, guys, good afternoon. Um, just had a couple of questions, uh, maybe just on the last point you made uh, right before the Q&A session. Just wanted to ask about uses of free cash in this market environment. Uh, clearly, 4Q was 
with a, with, with a stronger period than we anticipated, or at least a lot of us anticipated. One queues off to a solid start. Um, there's a lot of disruption globally. Um, and so just in general, as you think about things, um, how are you thinking about the, the uses of cash at this point, or at least say the main use of cash? Is it to lower debt uh, at this point, um, or do you still see opportunities for further expansion uh, beyond the current scope? Yes, uh, hello, good morning to you. Hey, look, the, the situation depends on how the market develops. At the moment, we see the market is, uh, is turning uh, quite positive. Uh, for the next uh, year or so, and even more in 2025, as we see also American economy doing uh, very well. Uh, so the the, ca the use of cash will be will be uh, split uh, for for uh, new buildings uh, with fleet renewal. We don't uh, we don't exclude the sale of uh, all the ships uh, to be replaced by. Uh, more modern ships, so it's not only the new builds that they are coming, there will be more modern ships added in the fleet. Will be some uh, share buyback, I know we didn't do in the last uh, quarter, but uh, we didn't have uh, the, we didn't have enough evidence that the market uh, uh, would perform. Right now we have enough evidence that the market is performing. And uh, we will uh, reduce also our uh, leverage. We don't want to increase the leverage from the current percentages as the new ships are coming in. So we want to keep it around the current level, so one third, 37, 38%. Uh, so, so we will use cash uh, for all these uh, things. Of course, everything depends on how the market uh, will perform. At the, at the moment, the signs are positive, and you know all the geopolitical uh, uh, situations and uh, and uh, uh, Panama Canal uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, reduced drafts and uh, no 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 comes no comes are much of post Panama are passing now through the canal coupled with the problem of the Red Sea. And I need to say here that uh, Safe Vargas was one of the first companies that uh, declared to its charters after the first hits of the merchant vessels in beginning December that we will uh, stop going through the, the Red Sea, simply because we don't believe that uh, our seamen are, uh, are, are, uh, are, uh, who are key workers and everybody recognizes seamen as key workers are to be used for uh, transporting through military areas. So like we don't trade in the Black Sea for the last two years, we decided not to trade the Red Sea for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. And this, I want to say, that is very well received by all the crew members of our ships. We control uh, the spot ships we have in the spot market, it's our decision, but also I'm pleased to say that uh, the majority of our charters accepted uh, immediately this, uh, this uh, condition. So it's very important this company to be doing business with the A-rated charters who share, uh, who share uh, uh, let's say, the responsibility against the seamen uh, to avoid, uh, at least for the next two, three months, uh, until things clear out, the Red Sea. It's not good to participate in conferences and we say that seamen are key workers and uh, like we did during COVID and nobody was accepting our seamen to get off either in Singapore or in China or in any other country in the world. We had to deviate ships to Manila at the time to disembark our seamen. Charters were not paying deviation cost or, uh, or calling cost. Very Express, so we had to take the ships to Manila, and the only country in the world that allowed safe corridors for seamen to be disembarked at that time, in the first half of 2020, was Cyprus, a small country. I'm not saying this because I come from Cyprus, because we are located, uh, our, we have our headquarters in Cyprus, but I have to admit that it was the only country that allowed uh, uh, change of crews. Uh, through a safe corridor 
because it's a small country that uh, government is pro-business and can take fair decisions very quickly. So the same now applies for the Red Sea. Until this situation is sorted out, charters should not pressing ship owners to send the seamen through the Red Sea, which uh, the seamen, they are not there to watch if the drones are flying over the ship or switch off the lights of the vessels passing through the area. Let's sort it out with the navies uh, as soon as possible this situation so we have safe passage again through the Red Sea. Thank, thank you, Paul. That's a very, very good uh, context um, uh, on everything as you kind of related things a bit towards the, you know, the COVID situation with the crew changes. I guess in this market, you know, there's been, I guess, two ways where, I mean, you're obviously much closer to it than we are, but there's, you know, clearly a spot contract and then there's the vessels on time charter. Is there a, is there a deviation in terms of how charters are, are looking at transiting through the Red Sea, at least from your lens and your ships? Um, are you still having vessels that are in your uh, uh, control operationally that are on contract or that are on time charter? Are those ships still, in some cases, being forced to go to the Red Sea um, by, by your, your customer? Yes, on all, on all our time charter ships, I'm proud to say that our charters are big names. They all cooperated, despite there was some cost involved. They cooperated, we let them uh, know early that we will not uh, accept to go through a military area or a war zone. And uh, uh, we even had a charter on a route from the continent to, to, to the Far East that halfway through the Mediterranean turned the ship around and went via the Cape Town. And I'm proud to say that with all these people, we reward them with more business and more ships. When we time charter for one year charters, we say from the start, we don't cross the Red Sea. The charters are happy to accept and they find the optional rules. So we should pay respect to, to the people who do the job. And the people, are the, they have families and they are the seamen. They are not military personnel. And even if we use armed guards on board our ships, uh, the armed guards are good against pirates. They are not good against drones and rockets. They can do nothing. So it's a very important matter, and of course I believe it, it will not take long to be solved. It will not be a matter of one year, more like two or three months. And, uh, and uh, you know, the World navies are in the area. They are taking care of matters, and uh, when the, the corridor is safe, uh, we will uh, start passing again, hopefully in the next two or three months. Yep, definitely. Okay, that makes sense. And then maybe just... Uh, final one for me, and it's just more of a follow-up to, to make sure I understood correctly. So, the you know, in terms of the share buyback that uh, you haven't yet put to work, clearly it was in a time of transition and uncertainty. But given how things are at this point, you have the conviction, uh, at least with respect to the dry bulk market, that now is the time to to, to buy stock. Uh, look, yes, we believe that it is time because now we have clear signs that the market is pushing up. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as a reminder, if anyone has any questions, you may press star one on your telephone keypad to join the question and answer queue. Our next question comes from uh, the line of Clement Morris with Value Investors Edge. Please proceed with your question. Good morning. Thank you for taking my questions. You've provided ample commentary on your fleet renewal approach, but I was wondering, would you provide some insight on the reasoning for focusing on ordering mid-sized vessels instead of cape sizes? Is it because of pricing or because you have a relatively more positive view on cancer maxes? Uh, what, what did you say? Because the line was not good. Why we invest in uh, mid-sized vessels? Yeah, instead of cape sizes. Yes, yes. We are not a cape size trade. There always we were feeling over the years a little bit uncomfortable with uh, with uh, with the type of vessel that relies on one commodity, namely iron ore, and a little bit of coal. We wanted to be more versatile and be able to trade on more routes. And uh, iron ore is uh, pro, let's say, China, China. Uh, uh, depending on the Chinese economy. Of course, now we are, I believe we are in the right phase also for Cape size uh, 
uh, opportunities. Of course, the competition there is huge. Uh, the order book is very low. I'm very positive for cage size as well, but uh, we are a little bit uh, uh, afraid that uh, maybe the, the, the high capital cost of ordering a cage size in a good shipyard, like uh, Japanese shipyards, it's more than $70 million. Uh, you know, you make only the calculation of interest rate at six uh, percent, and uh, you will understand that is uh, is a big risk for a company like ours to to step up uh, any major investment in that uh, sector. We did that in 2021. We bought four Cape size bulk carriers, which are earning handsome uh, rates for us now in the mid 20s for three years or two years or things like that. We, we fitted scrubbers to, on them that they are adding a good uh, million and a half per vessel per year. So we did our small investment there. And now I don't believe we'll get opportunity in the next six months. You know, we, we will try to inspect a couple of ships, but I'm hearing interest from 15, 20 buyers on every ship. I don't think we will be the winners of any of those bids. But uh, you know, we're happy that we have invested in the, at the right time, starting in 2020, in the Kamsamax new buildings, uh, the Japanese Kamsamax Phase 3 new buildings. In prices, we start investing was around $28 million. Today, the same ships are worth over 40 in the to order uh, from those yachts. So we're happy we have done. Uh, we continued in the in the business we know. We ordered a total of 16 units. And we are very well placed uh, since we have delivered uh, nine of those already in a good market and uh, seven more are coming, including two methanol uh, ships. So we are in a good position uh, overall, let's say. We are happy with our moves so far. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you for the color. I also wanted to ask a bit about the 2024 outlook for coal. China recently reinstated the tariffs, and I was wondering whether you expect this to have an impact on the overall market. Could you repeat the question because there are certain interruptions in the line? Yeah, the question is about China's tariffs on coal, which were recently reinstituted, and whether you expect that to have an impact on the overall market. Yeah, Chinese coal uh, imports are, were at the highest ever in the last, uh, in 2023. Uh, it's a vital, vital commodity for the Chinese. We know that at a certain point they will consider the environmental uh, uh, consequences and they will step back. But it's not, it's, it, the Chinese, I think, consume around 4 billion tons of coal a year. So they, they imported uh, quantity of, 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 of around uh, 10% of that amount is not is not uh, uh, that big, and I don't think they will uh, de-escalate from coal uh, in 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 uh, the next uh, let's say five to ten years. Later on, of course, we may see reduction of coal into into China, and we will see increase in coal into other areas like India, Malaysia. Uh, uh, Vietnam, Southeast Asia countries. So, so I think coal will always be there. And the thing is, if there is cleaner coal from other areas or technologies to fit, to to make it uh, more friendly to the environment, but I don't think coal will be reducing a lot in the years to come. Thanks for the color. That's all for me. I'll pass it over. Thank you for taking my questions and congratulations for the quarter. Thank you. Thank you. We have reached the end of the question and answer session. Therefore, I'll turn the call back over to Mr. Boris Ajwan for closing remarks. So, thank you very much for attending our uh, uh, presentation. And uh, we're going to discuss again with you uh, in the financial results of our next quarter. Thank you all and have a nice day. And this concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lives at this time. Thank you for your participation.